the children quietly dismissed, open your Bibles to James chapter 1. That town is never going to be the same. It'll never be the same again. It's just getting better. In James chapter 1, we're going to talk tonight about overcoming the identity crisis. Every human being really is born with an identity crisis because you're not born apart from the Word of God knowing who you are. So let's look at James 1.21. It says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all the remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save yourself. Let's pause there. What are we to do with filthiness and wickedness? Put it away. Is it there in this world? Yes. It's there, and you put it away. How do we receive the world word if it's going to be effective? Implanted, yep, and in humility. In humility, you see, why do you receive it implanted? You, you were here this morning, you know, why, why would you have to receive the word implanted? Because it is a seed, yeah, living seed. It's a seed. You know, seed can just lay on top of the ground or it can get root, and you have to let it come yeah. into your heart in humility and implant it. What will the word do in this verse? It says it's able to save your soul. Is your spirit already saved? Yes. Yeah, if you're born again, your spirit's saved. And I heard some, somebody say this this week. I forget who it is. He said this, your spirit is saved. How many are born again? Everybody here is born again. Hey, your spirit is saved. Your soul is in the process of being saved, and your body will be saved. How many of you know your flesh is not saved? Your flesh will do anything you let it do, okay? When you get to heaven, it'll be saved. Right now, you see, your spirit is saved, your body will be saved. We're tonight in the process of getting our soul saved. And what does that mean? It means getting your mind renewed. We said in this morning's service, Brother Hagen always said that your mind does not stay renewed any longer than your hair stays combed. And we threw out the interesting thought, what happens if we forbid combs one Sunday morning and all come to church with bedhead? Now, you know it's going to look different in here. How many of you know we would look a little different if nobody's allowed to come there? We just came as we were. Why? Because your hair does not stay combed. Amen? How many combed your hair before service? Everybody but John, right? <laughs> so, at any rate, no, I didn't say anything this morning. It must be nice. It must be nice. At any rate, we stay on top of our hair because we have mirrors. We have to stay on top of the renewal of our mind because we have... A yeah. mirror in this yeah. word. Yeah. Look at verse 22. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So if you hear the word and you nod your head yes, but you don't do it, what are you doing to yourself? You're deluding yourself. Verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. You know, we find out whether our, home, our hair needs a comb by looking at a mirror. We find out whether we're thinking straight and our soul is getting saved by looking at the Word of God. Look at the next verse tells us that. But one who looks intently, that means you stare at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, and an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. We find out who we really are by looking in this word. I heard somebody say this. He said, when you look in the mirror of the word, there is a reflection, an identity coming back at you. Yep. And the identity that you see in this word, word is different than the identity people will try to put on you. The identity crisis is the major problem of human existence. Who am I? You know, the great thinkers have spent many hours on that, and they've not come up with any good answers unless they found the Bible. Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Have, have we ever had a class in philosophy? Yeah. Oh my, what a waste of time. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying they were stupid. They're some great thinkers, but you are not going to know who you are unless you find the revelation of this word. Right. Everyone is busy trying to either find out who they are or prove who they are. When the devil challenged Jesus Christ's identity, Jesus spoke the word only. He said, you know, if you're really the son of God, make a stone into bread. He said, it is written. He didn't argue with him that much. And the truth is, 
Jesus, or excuse me, the devil knew good and well who Jesus was. You say, how do you know? Because every time he met him, he knew the demon and said, I know who you are. Yeah. yeah. The devil knew who he was. He knows you're the son of God. Way better than you know you're the son of God or the daughter of God. Yeah. But he's going to challenge you. And you don't argue with him. You just speak the word and let the word answer for you. If, if you are going to be certain of who you really are, you must find yourself in the word of God the way the Lord Jesus found himself in the word. And say, do you have scripture for that guilt? But let's go to Luke chapter 4. This is a happy message. Because it is, it's one of those things where you cooperate with it, but you don't have to make it be so. It's just finding out what is so. Luke chapter 4, Jesus came to his hometown. Now, if there's anywhere at all that you'll have trouble being all you are in God, it's in your hometown. Yeah. Okay, because the hometown folks know the whole story, right? That's right. Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. A couple questions. Do the people where you were brought up have an opinion about you? Yeah. Oh, sure. Had it been his custom every day of his, every Sabbath of his life to show up in his church? Yeah. Had he ever read this particular prophecy in this particular way before? No. You know what? Because God was releasing something new in his life. It was time to come forward. When God does something new in your life, everybody around you say, Hey, I knew you went. Yeah. There were people who knew me as a pastor's wife. They said, we know you, and you ain't no pastor. And you're right. At that time in my life, I was not a pastor. But when God puts that anointing on you and does something new, yeah. people have to either decide, okay, I see what's happening, and go with it, or something. Yeah. Okay. And, and your deal is not to get mad at it, no. but to be who you are in God. Uh, Verse 17. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place for his brain. Just a quick pause. Did the Lord Jesus Christ find his identity in the Word of God? He found the place where it's written about him. We're going to read a bit. He spoke this passage prophetically. He didn't just read the passage. That day he read it different. He read it over himself. Look what happens here in 18. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He set free those who are oppressed. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant. Sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Why? Because he just read that thing different. Yeah. He didn't just read a passage. He said, yeah. Spirit of the Lord. Okay? They recognized the difference. Yeah. Verse 21. And he began saying to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled. He said, the anointed one is in your midst. Yeah. If you ever tell people, I'm a, I'm a child of the living God. I'm anointed to preach the gospel. Just be careful who you tell it to. <laughs> okay. Look at verse 22. And all who were speaking, all were speaking well of him, wondering at the gracious words falling from his lips. And they were saying, isn't this Joseph's son? Don't we already have an M.O. on this guy? Don't we know who this guy is? We know this guy's a carpenter. Get his hammer and nails and get him back to work. But you know what? Jesus did not ask them who he was. Jesus asked the word of God. He got his identity. I don't care what you've done in the past that they, people try to put an identity on you, okay? Your past does not define you, but the blood of Jesus in this word defines you. Yeah. And um, I, in one way, I'm glad I found out about this in crisis because it was do or die. It was do or die. I don't want the identity I had created for myself in my early 20s. I mean, I was like, oh, woo. He said, why? Because I, I didn't think life was worth living apart from God. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to have a reason to live, I better find out who I am in God and see if that might give me a reason to live. And I just, I don't care what anybody thought. And it's, it's terribly freeing. Yeah. Because you see, if you do care, you will never be a woman minister. You can't last two weeks. If you do care, you begin pleasing the world and trying to be sure that they think you're the world's fickle. Yeah. The world's me. I'm not putting people down. That's just the way they are. You find your identity in God, you are safe, and you are secure. Now listen, people who know you, especially those who go way back in your life, will always underdefine you. Yeah. You say all people are unique. They just they look at things in the natural and they say, How could you be a great preacher? Yeah. How could you lead someone to the Lord? How 
Amen? They will always challenge anything new that God does in your life. But we have to follow the Lord Jesus' example in looking into the mirror of of God's word and accepting the identity and the reflection coming back at us. Now think about this. And he said, what is the point of this message? I want you to understand that in God, in Christ, you are greater than you think you are. If I tell you right now, I am the light of the world, the first thing you're going to think is, pastor has a messianic complex. Right? Isn't that just what you... I say, I'm the light of the world. <laughs> You're coming back. But did you know that in Matthew 5, 14, he said, you are the light of the world? Yeah. Now, before he said that, look at John 8, 12. He said, he's the light of the world. Your trouble is, you see, you hear, and you see Jesus there. Okay? God's view, he says, there we are. He who... He who he who joins himself in the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. Amen. He said, as you have sent me, I'm sending them. It says in 1 John, as he is, so also are we in this world. You think you and Jesus are two separate people, and he sees you as one. I'll show it to you in a minute. It's in 1 Corinthians 6. Now, wait a minute. Let's back up. I know I've lost half of you. He said, are you saying I'm God? No, but you're one with him. You are his representative. You are his hands and his feet and the love with which he loves people. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Do we have any trouble with that? No. Okay. He who follows me is not going to walk in darkness. He'll have the light of life. Now look at Matthew 5, 14. I think that's the right scripture. Yeah, 14 and 16. Jesus is still speaking. Did he tell the truth in the last scripture? So he probably told the truth in this scripture, right? Jesus saying to his disciples that you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that you may see your good works. They may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, understand this. I'm not trying to say that you should be God. You're not God. We're all clear on the fact that you're not God and I'm not God. Okay? But let's suppose that Jesus told the truth in that verse like he did in John 8 when he said, I am the light of the world. And let's suppose that you get up in the morning and you say, I am the light of the world. Today, I let my, shine, my light shine before men in such a way that they're going to glorify my Father in heaven on the light of the world. Hallelujah. You know, you're not going to do a whole lot of bunch of sin in that day. Yeah. You're not going to do a bunch of cussing or ugliness or hurting people. Yeah. Because you're aware of the fact Jesus Christ said you're the light of the world. Yeah. And you say, well, people in my hometown don't think so. The people who are Nazareth didn't think much of him either. But this word, this mirror, says that your identity is the light of the world. Now, if you say that aloud on your way to work, you'll be fine if you commute by yourself. You will hear the mother saying, Amen! Amen. And you will live brighter that day. If you go by Buster Subway, you will get some Snickers. I'm the light of the world. Yeah. You'll get some Snickers and possibly a psychiatric evaluation slip. Go see one. But the father would still say, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now, I have a question. When even Jesus said that, I am the light of the world, first is hated. That same chapter in John chapter 8 where they challenge his deity. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, they hated him. But now, let me ask you something. When he said, I am the light of the world, did he tell the truth? If you get up in the morning and say, in Auburn, Virginia, I am the light of the world. Or wherever it is in Fredericksburg, I'm the light. You were in Fredericksburg. The only way there, you say, I'm the light of the world today. You say, that's us. Now listen. You want to know why we're not seeing the miracles we need to see? Because any, if you take Reinhard Bonnke, the yeah. things he says, they say, oh, bless me. But he's seen the dead raise it. Now, they just yes. Reinhard, the Lord spoke this to Reinhard Bonnke. Well, I thought you might lose you. I didn't know I'd lose you this no. guy. You understand that Jesus said this scripture in Matthew 5, 14, you're the light of the world. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying individually we're the whole light of the world but collectively we are and if you don't do your little part we won't do that collectively right right where Bonnie said this people say how do you get miracles in your ministry he said I never did have miracles in my ministry until the Lord spoke one thing to my heart he said my word in your mouth is just as powerful as my word in my mouth wow yeah and that's a very simple statement it is you see we're the sons of God We have been born of God the way Jesus was born of God. You remember Jim Hall? Okay, not this Jim Hall. Hi, Jim Hall. There's a Jim Hall sitting there. A different Jim Hall from Minnesota came in ministry. The first year that Beth, Beth is our longest standing member of the church almost 30 years ago. Next year will be 30 years. Jim Hall came 
And she got baptized in the Holy Spirit when he prayed. Remember her? Okay. What was I telling you this about? I can't remember where we were. Anyhow. Right here, Bumpy, fulfilling destiny. What did Jim Paul say? I cannot. I have this book of destiny later. I can't. All right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jim Paul said something, and I can't remember what it was. It was going to be very important. I'm sure it'll come back to me. When the devil challenged Jesus Christ's identity, Jesus simply spoke the word. Boy, that makes me mad, because I know it was good. I just knew it was good. <laughs> Our problem is, we don't understand. Oh, I know. Okay, okay, I remember. Thank God. Thank you. He heard a sermon, and he said, on the surface, you would not give any awards to the sermon, because it was preached by a Hispanic man who had not perfect English. It was preached right down the border, like Laredo, Texas. And he said, he just kept saying the same thing over, but this man had a handle on one thing. This little Hispanic guy kept saying, we're the sons of God. And he said, if he said it once, he said it a thousand times, he said it was in the same message. He said, we're the sons of God. Yeah. We're the sons of the living God. And he said, I don't know what it was, but that man had such a revelation that finally from the end of the message, it poured into my spirit. We're the son of God. Yeah. He said, it's never that. And he said, if you listen to it, you'd say, that's not great hermeneutics. No, probably wasn't. But he's a son of God. And we are not at all convinced we're the son of God, that like Jesus is the son of God. Because if I know that I'm the son of God the way he is, I will live right. With God. And he's, yeah, go to first, first John. I'll show it to you. First John chapter 3. Hallelujah. You know that there's truths you've heard for years, but we haven't got them yet. There's certain things that if you just say it the way the Bible says it, I mean, Brother Copeland just reads scripture exactly what it's written. I'll say, oh, blasphemy. Yeah, the blasphemy if God hadn't said it. That's right. We're born. Wait, Jesus, Jesus is called the firstborn of many brethren. When he was raised from the dead, he was born again. He was born. That living word. He became so identified with us in sin that he was born again, the first of any breath. We got born in the same word. Yeah. He's divine, he's God, and him all things. We're not that, but we are part of his family. Yeah. Look at what it says in 1 John 3. Behold how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the sons of God, children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know him. I'd like to go a step further. Really, Christians, we don't recognize each other for who we are. I maybe sort of in this church we treat each other well. I want to tell you something. If I don't treat you well for any other reason, it's because you're a child of the living God, the apple of the Father's eye. People in this church, on the whole, treat each other really, really well. That's the way it's supposed to be. Okay? Look at verse 1. I'd like to translate it this way. What kind of ridiculous love is this that we should be called the sons of God? Verse 2, beloved, now we are the children of God. It's not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Oh, you know that verse. How, how absurd is that? Uh -huh. Because we will see him just as he is. Let me show you who he just said that you'll be like. We know that, how many of you know that when Jesus Christ appears, you're going to be like him? You're going to be the radiance of the Father's glory. Look at Hebrews 1.3. This is who we're going to be like. I mean, if this is true, we can get some folks healed. It's not. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. He, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of the Father's glory. The exact representation of his nature. We know that when he appears, we will be the radiance of God's glory. We will reflect his nature as exactly as Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? Now, here's the deal. If we, we can put it all off until then, or we can understand that he is in the process of making us the exact representation of his nature at this moment. The Holy Spirit's assignment in your life is to make you love like Jesus and think like Jesus and will like Jesus and be passionate about souls like Jesus. Yes. That's his work. Amen. And he is in the process of, of causing us to become. It says when he appears, we should, we should be like him because we will see him just as he is. Now look at this is what I want you to see between verse 2 and 3. Because if I tell you that in the morning I'm going to say, I'm the light of Colonial Beach. And you say, oh. and you say, I don't know if you should say that. What happens when you start saying that? It's right between verse 2 and 3 here. We'll see 
It says everyone who has this hope fixed on you purifies himself. When you start saying, I'm a child of the living God, I'm anointed to preach this gospel, just like Jesus was anointed. And you say, you can't say that. Which Holy Spirit did you get? Come on. Did you get like Holy Spirit number 45? <laughs> or number three? No. There's just one living God that created the heavens and the earth and that raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 8, 11 says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He will give life to your mortal body. And if he's on you to give life to your mortal body and you've received the baptism, he's on you for service. And when you preach, you preach with the same Holy Ghost. According to this, when we see Jesus, we will be like the one who is the radiance of the Father's glory. Who would ever have the audacity to say that? Somebody that believes the Bible. Yes. We have been born again of incorruptible seed. God's indestructible heredity is in you. A couple of these things I'm sharing that I've heard in this conference this week. David Sharon is a pastor in Las Vegas of all places. How would you like to take Las Vegas on? He's got a private church there. And he said this, last week, the world rejoiced at Prince George's birth because he's an heir to the throne. But the Bible says that every time somebody's born again, the angels rejoice. Why? Yeah. Because a prince is born. Yeah. If we get into our understanding who we really are in Christ, oh can you sit there, Makai? I'm getting here, good sermon. Hallelujah. We get to find out who we really are. It isn't that hard to live straight. I don't want to. I don't want to tell somebody off and act like the devil this week. Not about the light of the world. Amen. You say you can't say you're the light of the world. What do you do with Matthew five fourteen? Jesus looked his disciples straight in the face and said, "You are the light of the world." Yes. Yes. I said, "Well, if I say that, I'm going to have to live higher." That's the whole point. That gives that word the chance to to germinate in you and make you. The devil knew Jesus was the Son of God when he said, "If you're the Son of God, make that stone a piece of bread." He knows you're the Son of God when he tells you this week, you don't really believe the way you treated your wife, the Son of God. Get whatever you did under the blood or what you treated your husband. Anything. Righteousness and the understanding of righteousness is the only thing that keeps us from seeing the miraculous. Unless you're truly not living right. I figure most people who manage to on a Sunday night, most people don't live right or you wouldn't be here on Sunday night, all right? But other than that, if you're living with the best you know, nobody's perfect. If you're living with the best you know, the only thing that keeps us from seeing the miraculous is not understanding righteousness. The evil one will challenge your authentic identity to try to intimidate who you are. And I thought about this. I'm Sherry, 3 o'clock in the morning, Monday morning, gave them a good lecture on losing a passport. And she knows about losing a passport, she said, and you don't want to lose a passport. Because that passport establishes your identity unless you walk back into the nation that you love. Amen? Yeah. Passports are important. Amen. Understand one thing. This is your passport. Yeah. Everything you need in God. Yes. Philippians 3.20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven. Now the devil knows that better than you know it. And, you know, I keep going back to that sermon. You're the sons of God. You're the sons of God. If you didn't have any sermon, and I know that you think I was out of my mind if I stood here and said five hundred times, you're the son of God, you're the daughter of Almighty God. You've got the same privileges and the same right standing as Jesus. When you walk in up through the blood, he sees no more fault in you than he sees yeah. in Jesus. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on you to go yeah. preach the gospel. Yeah. If you yeah. said that every single day, I've got a list of scriptures here. That in 1970, a long time ago, something. But you know what I love? I go back to this word and this effervescent living word. It says alive and fresh today in 2013. It was in 1977. You know why? Because it's new. It's alive. It's fresh. And I never ever read through these scriptures. But this I could read you this. I would read this every single day up to three times a day when I was trying to overcome depression. And I'd say, my God supplies every need I'll ever have according to his riches and glory. The Lord is perfecting everything that concerns me. Nobody that waits for God's salvation is ever put to shame. I can do everything in him who strengthens me. I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. 
God has given me a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind. God has given me a spirit of fear. I can do nothing of myself, but with God all things are possible. All things are possible to me because I believe. He predestined me to become conformed to the image of Jesus. I'm his workmanship. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, and I walk by faith and not by sight. Jesus is the author and perfecter of my faith. He's able to keep me from falling. He's able to make me stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. God always leads me in his triumph in Christ. He manifests through me the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. I have the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. The spirit of the Lord rests on me. This from Isaiah 11. This, I was a daffy, daffy blonde. Now, I may not be natural now, but I was then. And I was, I mean, like, was like, locking keys in cars and, you know, just daffy. I started confessing this scripture and it changed my life. The spirit of the Lord rests on me, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And I delight in the fear of the Lord. I don't judge by what my eyes see or make a decision by what my ears hear. And I'll tell you a secret. Those two verses were written prophetically about Jesus. But do you know who we are? We are his reps on earth. You, you have to see that scripture at 1 John 4, 17. It says, as he is, so also are we in this world. How is he? Sick? Wow. No? Is he triumphant? Look at this. Yeah. It says, by this law, this perfection, this, so we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we. So when he, when that prophetic thing said, the spirit of the Lord rests upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel, spirit, strength, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, it spoke it over Jesus, but it also spoke for it over me. Yeah. Christ in me is my hope of glory. The greater one lives in me. My Lord is El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. In him I live and move and have my being. Yes. Every day I receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Oh, Christ redeemed me from the curse of the law, having become a curse for me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. My righteousness is a free gift. There is no longer any condemnation in my life. He will never be angry with me. That's my saying of 54. Nor will he ever rebuke me. I am anxious for nothing. I pray and I trust God for everything and his peace surrounds me. Everything I ask in prayer believing, I receive. I reign in life through Jesus Christ. I have been saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. I shall not be put to shame or humiliated throughout all eternity. The Lord satisfies my years with good things and my youth is renewed like the evil. My Father works everything after the counsel of his will and his will is very, very good. He calls us all things to work together for my good because I love him and I'm, and I'm called according to his purposes. No good thing does he withhold from me because I walk uprightly. You tired of this yet? I've got two no. minutes. I am confident of this very thing. I read this in my 20s. I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in me will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He delivered me from the authority of darkness and transferred me to the Kingdom of his beloved son, my citizenship is in heaven. The scepter of wickedness does not rest on my lot, for I am righteous, that I may not stretch forth my hand to be wrong. No weapon formed against me prospers. Every time that accuses me in judgment, I condemn. Jesus rendered the devil powerless. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. Hallelujah. Made a public display of them. Jesus himself bore my sins in his body on the cross that I, being good as sin, should live under righteousness. By his stripes, I am healed. I heard a man preach this way this week. This guy, David Sharon from North Vegas, and he just, the, the power of God was just pouring out of him. But you know what was pouring out of him was the word of God. The gospel is the power of God. And if you say, well, I just don't have a lot of power in my life, then I promise you don't have a lot of word because the word is That's power. Right. And, and you say, well, I don't know how to fight the devil for you. You don't have to fight the devil. You don't have to fight the devil anymore. Jesus didn't fight the devil. He spoke the word. The word fought the devil. Yeah. The word is omnipotent. And if you say, I don't believe the word is omnipotent, you tell me what stood. When God said, fight me, you tell me what stood. Fight me. The word. Everybody say, the word is omnipotent. The word. And then say that, it needs to be in my mouth. Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep who equips me in every good thing to do his will. He always lives to make the intercession for me. I hold fast to confession of my faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. I have entered his rest. I cast all my cares on him because he cares for me. 
I love him with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my mind and all of my strength, and he daily bears my burden. And you say, what good did it do you saying all those things? I don't know. I think it landed me in the perfect will of God. Yeah. yeah. Okay? And the thing is, I don't go back and I still see new scriptures, but those scriptures are like the bedrock of my life. That's who I am. And you say, well, we don't think so. I don't care. I love you. But I don't care. I have one who says she's my daughter and she's called and she's anointed. And I'm not, I'm not going to take public transportation where I can't confess the word of God. I'm just going to turn along my little man and say, thank God, this day his favor is on me. And he surrounds me with favors with a shield. The angels protect me day and night. And when you find out who you are, you love people and you wouldn't give a nickel what they think of you. I'm not, I'm not mad at you, but I'm just saying, if, if I give a nickel what you think of me, I really can't be your pastor because I'm not loving me, I'm loving you. Won't you please think well of me? I care about me. Come on, come on. Get it? But when I don't care about me and I care about you, I don't care what you think of me because I'm your pastor and I'll tell you the truth. Amen. I got it? See if there's anything here too good. The only other thing I had here was just that when the spies went in, oh, wait, it's time to quit. It's April. You know the story about when the spies went in. Ten men kept a whole generation tramping around the Israel in the desert for 40 years. Get how bad that is. We, we hear, oh, 40 years in the desert. How would you like to be 40 years in the desert? Same pair of shoes that you wore out of Egypt 40 years later tramping around in hot sand. That is not a life. Ten men caused that to happen. Because they said, we saw these giants, the grasshoppers, and our side. they had an identity crisis that flunked. Yep. And the weird part is, the truly weird part is, 40, later, 40 years later, when Joshua sent two spies in, Rahab said, we have been terrified of you since the day we heard how you're God. Uh, Read it in Joshua chapter yeah. 2. Rahab looked them in the face and said, we have been scared out of our wits for 40 years because we heard how your God parted the Red Sea. Yeah. And they said, we're grasshoppers in the way they believe they lie. There are so many Christians living so far under their privileges because we bought the devil's lie. Yeah. You say, how did you change? You get this word, and you say, that is who I am. And the yeah. devil said, won't the devil fight? You know, the devil really doesn't like to fight with the word. You put it in your mouth, he will bow his knee. Yeah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let's say something.